Hello, I'm Gary Bernstein at the University of Notre Dame. I'm going to tell you about our research at Notre Dame on uh, thermoelectrically coupled nano antennas. We call them technas and their applications for solar research. These technas are nano antennas that operate as infrared sensors out to the far infrared. First, I wanna introduce the uh, team working on this research. It's quite multidisciplinary. In alphabetical order, David Berghoff is a professor at Notre Dame. He does uh, far infrared sources and measurements. David Gonzalez is an undergraduate. He's been working with us for a year now and uh, has been getting involved in simulations. Ed Kinsel is a mechanical engineering professor. He's an expert at thermoelectrics and optics. Alexei Orloff and Wolfgang Porat are professors at Notre Dame. They do device physics and measurements. David Strobel is the CEO of Space Micro. His role is to advise us to move correctly in, in the direction of getting these things onto satellites and space missions. Gergo Jacmani deserves most of the credit for the devices that you're going to see, their fabrication, uh, the console simulations and uh, the optical measurements on these devices. And Stephen White recently joined us for this NASA work as our resident expert in solar physics. And he guides us in the right directions for uh, developing devices that will be of most value to his community. I think we should start out with defining a few terms. This is off of Wikipedia and definitions vary. Definitions vary and um, we need to define the terms uh, mid wavelength infrared, long wavelength infrared and far infrared. So we are interested in the infrared region from let's say below a little below eight to about a hundred microns. So we span mid wavelength infrared through long wavelength infrared where we do the work at Notre Dame and then into the far infrared where we have done some work and I'll show you the results in that regime as well. So uh, keep in mind mid is the shortest and far infrared is the longest of what it is that we do. So, so some basic introduction to the sun. Uh, we need to understand solar processes. So in short, the goal of this work is to develop antennas like this to help solar physicists understand this kind of thing. Here we've got the sun, which is 865,000 miles in diameter and a very large solar flare. But the point of this is to show you the size scale. Earth is this little dot right here. Things on the sun are vast and uh, the processes are extremely powerful. So for example, the magnetic fields that extend out into the corona, I'm gonna talk about uh, what these terms mean a little bit more in a moment, but uh, the, uh, the corona is the outer atmosphere and huge magnetic fields interact with the charged plasma and uh, a phenomenon called magnetic reconnection causes billions of uh, tons of, of, of um, plasma and hydrogen and helium gas to flow out into space. And if that hits the earth, then that can wreak havoc in our communication systems, our satellites and our power grid. So we wanna use our technos that are tunable and polarization sensitive to provide information into uh, the processes that are going on. Let's do some definitions of what the solar atmosphere is. Below the, what we call the surface of the sun is the convection zone. This is where massive circulating currents of plasma uh, bring heat upwards toward the surface and in doing so because plasmas are charged generate huge magnetic fields and this convection zone is something like 200,000 kilometers thick. Now the photosphere is the, 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 the part of the sun that we call the surface. It's really only the surface of the sun is because that's where light can finally escape from the sun. So from earth when we look at the sun we see the surface at which light is being emitted. So that's simply called the photosphere. The magnetic fields from the convection zone start down here, but they extend out beyond where we see, and that means that it extends out beyond the photosphere. The photosphere itself is only 100 kilometers thick, meaning that 
all the light that comes from below is absorbed at the surface, at the photosphere, and then is radiated out in, in black body radiation. So when we look at the sun, we see the black body radiation spectrum as being that of about 5,800 Kelvin. And I might as well mention that sunspots are cooler regions of the photosphere where magnetic flux tubes are being emitted from the surface and they are cooler and therefore appear darker. Of course, they're bright in themselves, but against the background of the sun, they appear darker. Above the photosphere is uh, the chromosphere. So that's the region where the magnetic fields are extending out where we can see them and we get flares and uh, huge loops of, um, of uh, plasma. So the chromosphere, uh, well, there are smaller flares, the larger flares extend further out into the corona, which I'll get to in a moment. So the chromosphere is about 5,000 kilometers and the temperature varies within the chromosphere from the temperature at the surface, the photosphere where we start to see it at 5,800 Kelvin and actually drops down to something like 4,000 or 5,000 Kelvin at a temperature minimum, then extends out and grows to 8,000, increases in temperature to about 8,000 to 10,000 Kelvin. Now beyond that is the corona, famously for being visible during uh, solar eclipses. And uh, the, that's the outer atmosphere where it's low density, low radiance, and it extends from above the chromosphere out to millions of kilometers, and frankly extends even all the way out to where the Earth is. And you could even say that the Earth is embedded within the, the sun's um, outer atmosphere, but uh, strictly speaking, that's not the corona. And the corona is very, very hot, up, uh, beyond a million Kelvin, somewhere between a million Kelvin and four million Kelvin. And there's this coronal heating problem, which is a way of saying that the, the reason that the corona gas is so energetic, is so hot, is not fully understood. And there are several competing uh, theories about why this is the case. So basically, we want to get involved in this game to provide data to the uh, physicists who do the modeling and hopefully, quote, shed some new light, I guess, literally and figuratively, on these kinds of problems. <coughs> the two main science areas that can ut utilize new mid to far infrared data are to better understand the structure and heating, how energy transport goes uh, among the layers of the sun, and also to elucidate the mechanisms by which solar flares interact with magnetic fields and how they uh, are generated. So in both settings, magnetic fields are critical and our uh, technas are polarization sensitive and polarization of light is affected by magnetic fields. So we are, our goal is to be able to image not only uh, new spectra, but also to get new information about the magnetic fields uh, in different regions of the sun and at these wavelengths. So I need to introduce a concept called optically thin and optically thick. And an optically thick layer simply means that light does not penetrate through that layer easily. Uh, optically thin is the opposite, it does. Uh, the reason for saying this is that if we have an optically thick layer, then all the energy that comes from one side and impinges on this optically thick layer will be absorbed. And these are non-thermal processes, but then as it heats, then through thermal processes, it generates black body radiation. And that's basically what happens at the photosphere. Energy comes in as being absorbed by that outer layer, and finally the light can escape, but it's been thermalized and we see it as black body radiation. <clears throat> the story isn't really that simple. The, optically thick, the optical thickness of the layer is wavelength dependent. So the photosphere is um, optically thick for radiation and generates light at the black body radiation temperature of 5800 Kelvin. But this isn't true for the long wave infrared and far infrared. Basically in the long wave infrared, that is absorbed till a much further region outwards, where it actually gets cooler toward the temperature minimum. 
And therefore, when we look at the sun at these wavelengths, so from 10 microns on out, it appears to be a black body radiator at a cooler temperature. So the, the uh, intensity of the long wave infrared is actually lower than you would expect from what we usually think of as the black body radiation curve at 5,800 Kelvin. So as I said, the chromosphere radiates this long wave radiation at lower temperatures. So it's relatively dark compared to the black body radiation at the general temperature of the photosphere. So there's less for us to detect at long wave infrared, but that will give us better contrast when we look at flare features uh, that are above the uh, chromosphere. So we need good calibration for irradiance applications. If we're going to make measurements, we need to have a way of calibrating those. And that uh, is the job of uh, our measurements in our lab. And also you can do certain calibration measurements with the moon, which we'll attempt to do. Polarization provides critical magnetic field information for us, as I mentioned. And the speed of our detectors should be relatively fast. I'm gonna show you that our detectors can be very fast. The, that's referred to as high cadence. And we want excellent spatial resolution to view the flares at these wavelengths, but Rayleigh criteria basically limits that resolution. If we're at 100 microns, that resolution is not going to be good as the kinds of images that I'll show you right now that are either in the visible or in the ultraviolet. So obviously the shorter the wavelength, the higher the resolution that you can get. These are Earth-based images uh, taken from the Daniel uh, K. Inouye um, Solar Telescope. So here, here's the status of where the field of infrared imaging, solar imaging is. First of all, there are basically no existing mid-infrared polarization measurements in flares. We would like to change that. Flare science has conflicts between whether it's thermal or non-thermal transport that goes between the various layers. And there's not enough data to help the, the, the models uh, parse out which are the more important processes, thermal or non-thermal. So mid-IR data can help pinpoint the height of emission, where the flares are coming from, where the chromosphere uh, basically begins and ends. The layer values are known in terms of their relative thicknesses, but their absolute thicknesses are not well known. Maybe we can help with that. And also the largest uh, telescope in the world, terrestrial uh, largest solar telescope in the world is the four meter Daniel K. Inouye, the DKIST, it's called, it's on Maui. And it's interesting to note that there is no instrumentation, even on the largest telescope in the world, beyond five microns. So what we're hoping to do is, is uh, add to that body of knowledge. To get long wave and far infrared measurements, it's done now by doing difficult experiments where you put your sensors on balloons or on, on airborne platforms and go up above the atmosphere and try to um, get data uh, where these, inf these uh, wavelengths can penetrate through the atmosphere. I'm gonna show a slide on that next, but let me just say that our goal is to eventually go to far infrared at 100 microns on satellites. And uh, that's one of the big things we hope to accomplish. So it's very important to get a sense of how much light actually penetrates our atmosphere. And these are different altitudes from 16,000 feet to 95,000 feet. As I said, all the long wave to far infrared data that we have comes from balloons or aircraft borne platforms. And we wanna get onto satellites. But this shows, if you look at 16,000 feet, that above about 30 microns, it really drops off to nothing. So we can't get data in these wavelengths, even if we have the detectors on Earth, but we still need to develop them for the satellites. So how are we gonna do that? Well, this curve shows the transmission of only one meter of air with a humidity of 40%. And there are huge gaps in the uh, spectrum of what can even be measured at one meter. But in our labs, we have access to terahertz quantum cascade structures that can work in these wavelengths. 
And we can do these measurements in the lab. We can qualify our sensors out to far infrared and we can start preparing for future missions. Okay, so that's all I wanna say about the sun itself. And now I wanna tell you about the nano antennas. So we'll start by comparing them to existing technologies. Uh, there are photovoltaic detectors, quantum detectors, like Mercad telluride and other materials-based detectors. They, they work on electron hole pair generation. And for long wavelengths, these are low energy, of course. They're fast and, expense, uh, and, and sensitive, but they're expensive and they need to be cooled in order to get the energy below the noise levels. So as far as space-based missions are concerned, this is uh, certainly not going to help things in terms of the power and the payload. Now, much more common detectors are the thermal detectors uh, based on bolometers where the light heats a, a surface that heats a thermocouple and these are uncooled and they're cheap, but they're very slow, limited to just a few hundred hertz. Our detectors are very different. Ours are based on nano antennas. They, uh, the technas are nano antennas. This is a nano antenna. And these are the lead lines uh, where we take the signal out from our thermocouples. So light uh, is resonant on the antenna. They heat the thermocouples. I'll show you in the next slide. And uh, they, uh, we get a voltage based on that. So ours are fundamentally very fast because they're low thermal mass. They're uncooled be, uh, because uh, they're resonant with the wavelength. They're polarization sensitive just by their very nature and they're frequency selective based on the length of the antenna that we choose to build. So as antennas, they operate exactly the same as conventional larger antennas. For fun, I put a picture of the electrical engineering building at Purdue where I got my master's degree. And it, when I was there, there were these massive antennas on the roof. Well, our nano antennas work the same way as these antennas do. They're directional, polarization sensitive, and frequency selective. This GIF shows an electric field coming in from a photon and it um, interacts with the electrons and the antenna causing uh, electrons to oscillate back and forth. The peak of the current is in the middle where the detector is placed. So this detector could be a preamplifier, but for us it's simply the resistance of the antenna which heats up due to joule heating. That current turns into heat and that turns into a thermoelectric voltage. Let me show a little bit more about that. So here's a, an electron micrograph of the large uh, parts of our nano antennas. This is the nano antenna right here. These are the lead lines. And um, the way this works is that light is incident on the antenna. It, it's resonant with that wavelength and the electrons go back and forth uh, on the uh, antenna. And joule heating causes heating primarily in the center of the antenna where the current is at a maximum. And due to the Seebeck effect of these nano uh, thermocouples, we develop an open circuit voltage. And that open circuit voltage causes, uh, as the heat rises, we measure that voltage. And that is the output of our nano antennas. We have a measurement set up with a CO2 laser and the CO2 laser is polarized at its output. We have a half wave plate that uh, we can rotate the polarization and we chop it for a lock-in amplifier. Our laser is in the long wave, it's 10.6 microns, that's a typical CO2 laser. It's, and it uh, produces 1.4 watts per square centimeter on our devices. So that's relatively high <coughs> and it's allowed us to uh, develop, uh, continue to improve our sensitivity from low sensitivity to what is now getting up to be fairly respectable sensitivity. Um, so let me move on from that. I, I'm going to give you the bit of a history of how these nanothermocouples were, uh, nanothermocouples and nano antennas were developed. This is one of our earliest experiments where we had a nano antenna connected through a nanothermocouple and we used a heater. And by heating it, we could measure the response of the nanothermocouple without any radiation incident on the antenna. Uh, 
So we found that the heater response was good, so the thermocouples worked. Then we turned off the heater and turned on the laser, and we found that we got good IR response. But that didn't necessarily separate the effect from the um, heater and the antenna. But we used an antenna with one missing arm, so it was not the appropriate length to be in resonance. And when we used the heater, we still got the same good response, but the IR response from the laser was very weak. This is strong indication at the beginning that we really did have uh, heating from the antenna to the thermocouple. So now that I've introduced the role of the, of the nanothermocouple, I should talk more about these uh, and tell you just some basic information about thermocouples. So materials, metals have a Seebeck coefficient. If you heat one end of a metal and you cool the other end of the metal, you get a voltage drop across them. A thermocouple is a combination of two metals where a voltage is measured across the cold junction. And the voltage that's measured is proportional to the difference in the absolute Seebeck coefficients of the metals. So you heat one junction, cool the other two junctions, measure the voltage across the cool junctions, and that is the voltage output of a thermocouple. And that output voltage is proportional to the difference in temperature between the hot junction and the cold junctions. So on our antennas, this is the hot junction and the cold junctions are way out, far from where the light is illuminating it. But if the light illuminates the entire surface so that there's a general uh, background increase in temperature, we still have a preferential heating due to our nano antennas and our delta T is the same. And we've shown that by using a hot air blower and heating the entire chip and our output signal is basically unchanged. This was our original characterization platform for our nano antennas. So this shows the entire test structure. The cold junctions are way out here, and we built a heater in here to heat our thermocouples. So the way this works is we built a thermometer that we characterized inside of a cryostat with very accurate temperature control, and we measured the, the change in the resistance, the temperature coefficient of resistance of this uh, thermometer wire. And we built this in such a way so the heater was down the middle, the thermometer was on one side, and our thermocouple was on the other side. And it's symmetric so that if we measure a temperature here, we know that the thermocouple is experiencing exactly the same temperature. So based on that, we were able to characterize our, our nanothermocouples and we were able to get the relative Zeebeck coefficients of our materials. The largest uh, relative Zeebeck coefficient S was due to the palladium chrome uh, thermocouples, but those are fragile and they suffered from stress. So we didn't use those. The one uh, next one below that was um, palladium nickel. And that has a relative Zeebeck coefficient of nine uh, uh, microvolts per Kelvin. So those worked well enough. Unfortunately, because these are at the nanoscale and there's more scattering, the relative Zeebeck coefficient of the nanothermocouples uh, is only about a third that of bulk thermocouples, which is something we just have to live with. And it led to, uh, that phenomenon actually has uh, led to uh, a very interesting observation. And that is that when we built devices out of a single layer of metal with a size discontinuity, they behaved, the size dot discontinuity behaved as if it were a thermocouple. So here we've got the situation where we have a relative Zeebeck coefficient that's size dependent that allows a monometallic nanothermocouple. So the same metal simply having different widths. Now it could seem as if uh, to use the term monometallic thermocouple is like an oxymoron. Everybody knows that a thermocouple is two different kinds of metals. But here we show that in the, in the same metal, just the size discontinuity can uh, provide the uh, difference in uh, absolute Zeebeck coefficients that creates a thermocouple out of a single layer. So we did the same kinds of experiments where we built our heater and thermometer and thermocouples. Uh, and what we observed was where there was no difference in thicknesses, we did not get a voltage. Both thin and thick, we did not get a voltage. But where there was uh, measured 
a voltage where there was a discontinuity, we did get a voltage. And we found that out to about a difference of about um, 400 nanometers, we increased our relative Zbeck coefficient. So the next thing we wanted to do was figure out how fast we could switch our nanothermocouples. We knew they were low mass, but could we prove that they could switch on and off very quickly? So we used um, what is called the three omega technique uh, to do this. Now, it's important to understand that as the current changes at a frequency omega, the dissipated power, which is I squared omega, uh, changes with a uh, frequency component of two omega. You can, just like an incandescent bulb, every half cycle, the light bulb heats and uh, it doesn't matter which direction the current is going, it heats on the positive half and it heats on the negative half. So basically, an omega current translates into two omega of power. Well, it's a little more complicated than that. It turns out that the resistance is in itself temperature dependent and that changes with a frequency of uh, two omega. So let's assume that the, that the, that the uh, temperature coefficient of resistance of, of our heater resistor is constant over a small temperature range. Well, the resistance changes as two omega because the power through the heater goes as two omega. And the current goes as omega, so, and the resistor goes at, the resistance goes as two omega. So the voltage that we measure across our heater in our, uh, therm in our uh, thermometer setup has a three omega term. So we have a three omega term which represents the heat and we've got a two omega term which represents the voltage across the, uh, uh, the thermocouple. So we compare these two terms, the two omega signal from the thermocouple and the three omega signal from the heater and they should go exactly the same because it's the heat that leads to the signal from the thermocouple. And that's exactly what we see, that as a function of frequency, the uh, two omega term and the three omega term follow each other very closely. Now out to more than 100 kilohertz, a couple of hundred kilohertz, it's pretty flat. And then the signal from the thermocouple starts to drop off. So the question is, is it dropping off because our nanothermocouples don't work any faster than a couple hundred thousand hertz? Or is it dropping off because the heater doesn't work above a couple hundred thousand hertz? And the fact that these two are so closely aligned that the nanothermocouple at two omega follows the three omega signal from the heater says that no, it's the, it's the heater that, that's heat synced and cannot be heated any, any faster than uh, we start losing the signal out to about um, 11 megahertz. But the nanothermocouple follows that all the way out to 11 megahertz. Now, we already showed that with the current frequency at 11 megahertz, the heating goes at twice that, at two omega, 22 megahertz. So what we've shown here is that the nanothermocouples, at least on the chip where they're heat synced, can be switched all the way out to um, uh, 22 megahertz. <clears throat> now we talk about polarization of the technus. I wanna explain that and how that works and how we do those measurements. So a couple uh, terms that when the polarization is along the antenna, we call that copolarized. And when the uh, polarization is in the opposite direction, perpendicular to the antenna, we call, call that cross-polarized. Now you look at this and say, you might say, well, if it's cross-polarized, why are we not going to get a signal in both directions? The answer is that the heating of the thermocouple comes from the resonance of the antenna because of its length. And that does not happen when the polarization is in the direction of the lead lines. There isn't this phenomenon of resonance that increases the heating of the thermocouple significantly. So you can see better here, the antenna has a certain width and uh, cross polarization is along this direction. So this is early polarization data on one antenna and it shows that indeed there is a polarization effect that every 90 degrees it switches from copolarized to cross polarized and back again. 
we also show that the bimetallic uh, thermocouple gives a larger signal than the monometallic thermocouple, which we know from measuring the relative Zeebeck coefficients. But monometallic nanothermocouples are easier to fabricate, they're more reliable, but they're less sensitive, as you can see here. Anyway, so this is more um, validation that our antennas really are just conventional antennas in that they're, the cosine squared dependence is predicted from simple antenna theory. I want to go over uh, another early experiment that we did that uh, shows that these things work exactly the way that we say they do, meaning that they're thermocouples with resonant antennas. We built this structure that had a uh, monometallic thermocouple connected to an antenna and two of these at right angles to each other. Here's the antenna, here's the thermocouple. And when the polarization was either uh, at zero degrees or at 90 degrees relative to our structure, we had equal heating on both sides and therefore no output voltage. Whereas if it was uh, co-polarized with the left side, we had heating on this one and co-polarized with the right side, we had heating on this leg. And that's demonstrated in these pictures. But the data shows that as the co-polarized co direction changes from one leg to the other, the hot junction switch sides. So the, uh, the polarity of the voltage changed sign. And also it shows that the resonance, resonant length of the antenna mattered here too. So lots of different phenomena uh, demonstrated in these experiments that further verify that what we think is going on in our devices really is. <coughs> One of the benefits of our nano antennas is that they're, they're tunable by length. We can select which range of radiation we want to investigate by changing their length, meaning we want to um, measure all the way from the medium wave to the far infrared. And we can do so by changing the length of the antennas. This is a console simulation, and th this is experimental data of different antenna lengths. And we find that the console predicts very accurately where the resonance happens with the uh, antenna. So we can select this, and uh, as we change the dipole length, our resonant length changes as well. So we took this to the extreme, at least for uh, for our measurements, and we went well into the terahertz. We got to 600 gigahertz, which is a 500 micron wavelength, and we built antennas, and uh, we built them in two flavors. Uh, one flavor was uh, uniform thickness, and the other flavor was pinched, had a narrow wire in between. So the simulations of um, console simulations show that electrically they aren't very much different. Even with this uh, thinner region in here, the resonance is still at 90 microns, although uh, the uh, reflection coefficient got a little bit uh, worse when we added this feature to the center of the antenna. But console simulations predicted that because the resistance is so low here, we would expect not to have any heating because the resistance is so low, whereas when we put the thin nanowire in the middle, that could get hot, and then we could get a large temperature increase. So we built these things and we tested them, and uh, they're on silicon. And the experiment we did was to put multiple thermocouples in series, like a little thermopile, but on one, one antenna. And we showed not only did these things work at uh, 500 microns, but we could get a uh, larger output voltage depending on the number of nanothermocouples that we put uh, to get a larger voltage out of the hot region in between in the center of the antenna. And this also shows that everything works right. They're polarized, uh, they scale with the number of uh, nanothermocouples and everything. The main problem for us was that we didn't have a calibrated 600 gigahertz source. We didn't know exactly what the power was, but we definitely showed that uh, the antennas work the same at these wavelengths as at the infrared wavelengths. So we're very concerned about where we lose heat from our thermocouples. And we did simulations uh, with equivalent circuits of heat loss. And we also uh, did simulations of the temperature increase 
uh, as a function of position on the antenna. And what we showed was that the major heat loss is through the substrate. We lose heat through the lead lines, which causes the, these dips at the center of the temperature, even though that's the hottest point, we're losing heat the most through the lead lines. But we know that the, we, we could get to much larger temperatures and much larger open circuit voltages if we didn't suffer through the heat through the substrate. So here we've got silicon dioxide on silicon as we were testing them. And the silicon dioxide was supposed to be a thermal blanket. But even with that, it doesn't compare to our latest design, which is suspending these antennas. So they're basically embedded in just air, which is much less conductive than silicon dioxide and silicon. And they're suspended over these cavities. Well, we didn't make this up. The Arecibo telescope got to us first. You know, any, any uh, satellite dish works under this principle. So our antennas work the same as the Arecibo satellite dish, only 22 million times smaller. And here's our suspended antenna and here's the sus suspended satellite dish over Arecibo. So we expected these things to work and we did simulations and showed that depending on the depth of the cavity, we could either get constructive interference at our antenna or destructive interference at our antenna. So the depth of the cavity matters and we set out to build uh, these antennas with different cavity depths. The first thing to point out is that our output voltage uh, for our antennas on a silicon dioxide on silicon substrate is down here. And our output voltage is like 100 times greater when we suspend it over our cavities. And as we change the cavity depth, we see this interference phenomenon of, of uh, the light focused on our antenna or away from our antenna. So one basic question is, what gives us this increase? Is it more the, um, the focusing of the light or is it more the insulation from the substrate? And through simulations, we show that about 30% of that is due to the insulation and 70% of that is from focusing more radiation onto our antenna than the antenna absorbs just by the incident radiation alone. So we're making good progress. We've got a factor of 100 here. Then we took these and put them into thermopiles, which is a tour de force of fabrication on Gergo's part. And these things worked. So all 200 technas were operational. And we got the series voltage of our antenna output voltages from that. And we see that the output circuit, uh, output uh, voltage, the open circuit voltage, uh, scaled with the number of antennas. So now we're up in the hundreds of microvolts range, not in the nanovolt range where we started. So we're really up there where we can use these things uh, as detectors without lock-in amplifiers. We're interested in how fast we can switch our uh, technas uh, that are in our uh, thermopiles. And uh, we find that they're slower than the 22 megahertz that we showed minimum when they're on the substrate because they don't have the cooling mechanism through the substrate. But we do show that the 3 dB point is well into the hundreds of kilohertz. And uh, that's very encouraging and still very fast. So now's the time to make a comparison with existing technologies. Got a bolometer, pyroelectric detectors, Merck CAD telluride, uh, type two super lattices and quantum well infrared photo detectors, quips. So a comparison of our technology to those technology looks like this, that uh, our spectral range can be very large. We could even bring this out to 500 microns if we wanted to, much more limited in existing technologies. Ours are inherently polarization sensitive and others are not. Uh, our operating temperature is room temperature and uh, the exotic expensive ones are not. Uh, we do not require bias. So we don't need the circuitry to bias them. Everybody else does. Uh, our cadence can be upwards of a, a megahertz, uh, which is still considerably faster than even the fastest of competing detectors. Ours are low cost. Others range from medium to very high cost. The, the fly in the ointment is that so far, our detectors are not as sensitive. They're still 
an order of magnitude less sensitive than even uh, the least sensitive of the commercial detectors. So what are we going to do about that? Uh, well, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, we intend to put our detectors um, into telescopes. We um, are going to do sun as star measurements and then grow out of that into a much larger telescope planned to have 22 inch aperture and a focal length of over two meters. And it's going to be challenging to do measurements at these far infrared wavelengths because uh, the um, sun doesn't give us much. So here's the irradiance at Earth uh, from the sun at visible wavelengths. It's basically four orders of magnitude down at the um, long wave infrared at 10 microns or so, and another four orders of magnitude radiance down, irradiance down at far infrared. So we definitely have to get the um, sensitivity of our detectors up. So how do we intend to do that? We have a lot more things in our toolbox that we're going to do. One is that we can uh, coat the inside of our cavities. We rely on just the natural reflection, which is only 30%. If we can get that up to 100%, we get two and a half times more signal. We can change our thermocouples. And by doing that, changing the thermocouples in the lead line so that we have a higher relative Zbeck coefficient from something like a type E thermocouple and decrease the amount of thermal loss, which will decrease our frequency, our cadence, but we're still well above what's needed. Um, we get a 14 times improvement from that. If we put these in vacuum, which will be easy on satellites and we think we can package them terrestrially in a vacuum, we get 10 times higher output signal. And um, again, we take a hit at frequency, but we have lots of frequency that we can afford to give up. We think we can get these up into a range of the low 10 to the 11th Jones, and that will be um, commensurate with even uh, some of the best detectors out there. But we could still increase the number of antennas that are inside one cavity, and that can increase our D-star up to another factor of 10. And if we do that, we could compete with insensitivity with the very most sensitive detectors that are out there. So in summary, uh, I've told you about a little bit about the sun and the problems that are uh, solar physicists are being faced and the need for more data from uh, medium wave infrared out to the far infrared. And I told you about our antennas that can operate within these wavelengths and uh, they can be very fast and they're very scalable. So we could deploy many uh, different antenna lengths on one detector on, and get uh, multispectral imaging of the sun in real time and also polarization information at the same time. And told you about uh, the latest um, embodiments of our antennas using cavities and uh, that give us large gains in sensitivity at still relatively high speeds and can be scaled up to large arrays for getting large signals. So if you have any questions or you want to contact me, this is my contact information. I'm at the University of Notre Dame. It's my phone number and my email address. Um, thank you uh, very much for your attention. I hope to hear from you.